Okay, so how is everyone today? Hello. So calculus. Uh, so this is the syllabus. There's one right up here for you. <laughs> no, well, 10 seconds. <clears throat> so this is the syllabus. Uh, the syllabus might change just slightly as the semester goes, uh, but really the only change that might occur is uh, I scheduled what topics we'd go over on what day, but that's like really hit and miss. So that might change a little bit, but essentially nothing else will change. Um, you can find the current version of the syllabus right here at this link at all times, and you, you can see the last time it was compiled by checking that. So if, if you look online and the date is newer than that date, then something has changed. Okay. So um, I'm Dr. Brady McCary. This is my email. This is, this, that's the best way to get a hold of me uh, is email. <clears throat> I have an office on campus. It's FA 2.402. That's Founders Annex. Um, I have office hours Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 1 to 3 p.m. I understand that that might not work for all of you all the time. That's fine. Send me an email, and we can probably get something worked out if you want to come see me. Uh, I wrote an R for Thursday because, well, I wanted to use one letter for the day, and Tuesday had T all tied up, so R sounded good. All right, uh, so... This is the textbook uh, for the course. Uh, at least this is the instructor's edition. So yours won't say instructor's review copy. Okay, you probably already have the 11th edition of this book by virtue of having taken Applied Calculus 1. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if you get a textbook or not. Okay, what, however, what we will be using is we'll be using my math lab, which you also used in Applied Calculus 1. And when you, get, when you uh, purchase the my math lab license, uh, you'll get access to um, the text online through my math lab. So you can click and then see the, the textbook pages. Okay. So any question about the book? Okay. Should be the same as, as the last course. Uh, we'll be using my math lab, should be just like Applied Calculus 1. So there are some required supplies for this course. Uh, the first one is you need regular access to, to a computer to check your UTD email. So each of you and I have a UTD email address. Um, any communication that is between us is by definition, in university policy, university business. And therefore, it has to go through university email if, it's gonna, if it goes through email at all. So what I'm telling you is that I totally get it if you've got a Gmail account or Yahoo or whatever. I get it. So I do too. Of course I do. Everyone does. But if you send me an email from your email address and it's not your UTD email address, I, it will literally just be deleted. I'm just not even going to see it or look at it. I'm just going to ignore it, okay, as if it doesn't exist. Okay, so you have to send me your, your email messages from, from your UTD email to my UTD email, and, and vice versa. I have to do it from my UTD email to your UTD email. Okay, now that being said, everybody's email has a, in, has a quota, which is to say it can only get so full Okay. So that means that, you know, if your Aunt Sally just sent you, you know, 68 images of her trip to Hawaii and your inbox is full, <laughs> then you're not going to receive any more messages. You need to fix that. Okay, good. <clears throat> so uh, you'll need regular access to a computer to do your My Math Lab homework, the online homework. Uh, you'll need regular access to a printer to print the written homework. So they'll, besides the online homework, there'll be written homework where you go to a web page, you download certain sheets of paper, you print them, you do the exercise, you turn them in. Okay, so you need regular access to a computer to get those pages and regular access to a printer to print those pages. 
Uh, you'll also need a calculator. This calculator uh, must be a scientific calculator and it cannot have the ability to do any algebra, calculus, or plotting whatsoever. Okay, it's just not allowed. So no plotting, no algebra, no calculus. So for the homework, I don't really care what you use because I can't police that stuff. Okay, but on the proctored assignments like quizzes and exams, you can use a calculator, but it cannot be, it cannot have the ability to do, to do any algebra, calculus, or plotting. And if you use such a calculator, you're going to be turned in for academic dishonesty. Okay? So if you're not sure whether or not your calculator is um, okay, I'll be glad to look at it after, after class. Okay? The one that I recommend is this one. This is the one I'll be using in lecture. Uh, at the present time, it's about $15 at Walmart. It's a TI-30X Roman numeral 2S. Which makes me, every time I say that, it makes me wonder, where did they come up with all those letters and modifiers, right? <laughs> What's with that? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, some things that are not allowed. So that's the required supplies. There's some prohibited supplies. Uh, I don't, uh, you can have your cell phone out whatever while you're here. That's fine. Please be courteous to your colleagues and turn the ringer off. Um, you can use a computer in here if you need, okay, but if you're going to use a computer in here, or in fact any screen whatsoever, uh, then you need to be sitting such that no one behind you can see the screen. So if that means you need to sit at the back, then that's what it's going to have to be. Okay, so then, now, the, the reason is really quite simple, okay. So this is, a, this is a summer math course, two hours and 15 minutes. That is a terrible idea, by the way. You know that the average human being can only really focus their attention for about 15 seconds? Really. And then the mind wanders, and then it can be brought back uh, with various efficiency. Okay? But then that, that losing attention and bringing it back every 15 seconds, that can only occur for about, like, absolute maximum 20 minutes. That's it. So, really, we've only got about 20 minutes. The rest of this is just going to be me talking. <laughs> well, hopefully not, right? But, <clears throat> so here's the deal. If you're going to need a screen, then it needs to be not visible. Because we're in here for 2 hours and 15 minutes in the summer, taking a math class. And if you've got a screen visible, and it's got a cat doing hula hoops or whatever entertaining thing that you could put on a screen, I can't compete with that. Yeah, I just can't compete with YouTube and cat videos. Okay, so you're going to have to take your screen to the back okay, or not use one. Okay, now during the quizzes and other proctored assignments, you can't use um, any communication device whatsoever. So that means that no cell phones, no smart watches, no smart eyeglasses, <laughs> or whatever. Okay, you just, just can't use that. It's between you and your calculator. <laughs> that's, that's what you got. Um, <clears throat> we'll be using uh, Blackboard, which is the course management software that UTD uses. It's prob probably, you know it by the name eLearning. You've probably used it in all your other courses. We're going to use it too. Um, <clears throat> there is a place on campus called the library. It's a nice place. They've got books there. Uh, you should consider going. But uh, we'll be using it, but not for the books. We'll be using it because in the basement of the library, the, the, the ground floor, uh, is the testing center. So the testing center is a place, it's a big room. They've got a big room, it's got computers in there. Uh, we're going to take quizzes every week. You're going to go there and you're say, you'll say, hi, I'm so-and-so here to take the quiz number eight for Math 1326. And they'll say, okay, let me see your ID. And then they check you in. Okay? And you'll only be allowed to take in a writing utensil and a calculator. Now, they have lockers, and you can put a purse or a reasonably sized backpack in the, in the locker. It's like a high school locker. So it's not going to fit 
a grand piano or you know one of those real big wakeboard skateboard things that everybody's going around on these days so don't take your don't take your cool stuff there or your big stuff to the testing center okay any question about that okay <clears throat> uh, so this web page the one that says course web page uh, will be you'll be using that a lot that's that one's probably worth a bookmark okay so I'll be using the document camera during lecture and I'll be writing on pages uh, and after the lecture is over uh, I'll go back to my office and scan those pages and post them and they'll be posted here so that'll be nice right you'll be able to look at a PDF PDF of all the notes terrific okay and besides a PDF of the notes I'm also recording this with a video I've got a little camera right here and it's recording it and that'll be posted to YouTube okay so then there's really no excuse for saying I didn't know what happened in lecture because because you just look it up right okay now that being said so that's real convenient and that, that's the purpose is, is to help you but you shouldn't take that as license to say well that's it I'm not gonna do anything in here I'm just gonna come in here and watch it like a really boring movie right <laughs> watch watch a math lecture no you shouldn't do that okay you shouldn't you shouldn't take it as license to do that because that totally ignores the way that you're made okay so then memory and comprehension in human beings is tied very closely to emotional content and and uh, activity of the time so that means that I'm gonna try and be a little bit funny as funny as can be okay, for a math for a math class okay? and you should try and be engaged in doing something that means writing something asking a question trying the exercises that I pose because if you just sit there and watch it okay you're gonna miss it you're not gonna get it okay so don't don't treat this like a movie okay <clears throat> uh, other things that will be posted at this at this web page is that the written homeworks that you'll have to download and print they'll be posted there <clears throat> and then you'll turn those in and uh, once they're graded they'll be scanned I'm not gonna return the originals to you but you'll be able to download scans of those pages here and only you will be able to get your scans no one else will be able to get your scans because it's all behind a, each each of you has your own password and all this stuff okay good so there's another place uh, that's also in the library actually uh, I forgot they moved to a different floor they're somewhere uh, it's called the math lab your your tuition and fees have already paid for it so this is something that you've paid for and you can go to the math lab and say hi I'm here and I need help <laughs> with this calculus stuff and that's that's what that place is for okay so besides my office uh, you can go to this other place okay I, I wouldn't call it free because you've already paid for it but you don't have to pay to go there any more okay so any question about that so <clears throat> the makeup policy for the course is that if you don't have a university approved excuse there is no makeup Okay, I totally get it. Everybody's got things that go on, like, oh, I had a flat tire, or, oh, my dog had a flat tire, or whatever happened. Okay, I get it. That's fine. But that's, that's not a university-approved excuse, and we're not going to do it. We're not going to do a makeup. Now, you might think, well, that's a little harsh. Well, let's wait just a minute until we talk about the assignments and I promise you there's actually a great deal of slack built in to the system for the explicit purpose to acknowledge that oh everyone's got something that comes up okay so so just wait just a little bit till we get there before you object so now um, just some notes is that this course is about showing your work so if you don't show your work you should have no expectation of receiving credit at all 
which is to say that you might have taken a course like in sixth grade in Miss Harris's class, a math course, where the answer somehow was 42 apples. And if you somehow wrote a 4 and a 2, and they were more or less close enough together to be construed as a 42, then you got full credit for that exercise, regardless of whatever other gibberish you wrote on the page. Okay, that's not what this course is. Okay, this course is about making a reasoned argument about the, about the mathematical topic at hand. And if your argument is nonsense, but, you're, but you write 42, you get a zero. Okay, now that sword cuts both ways, which means that if you produce some of the argument correctly, then I am obliged and I will give you partial credit. Okay? Good. Uh, other things include things like, uh, I'm going to send you messages like such and such assignment is available and, is it, and you have to turn it in in a week or whatever. And if, if you just don't check your email for a week <laughs> and you say, well, I didn't know about that assignment, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just your problem. It's not my problem. Okay? I'll never ever do something weird and say something like, okay, this assignment is due in 17 minutes. <laughs> We're not ever going to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so, there's, this link gives you official UTD policies. <clears throat> so, so, this URL, uh, the contents of this URL are part of every syllabus at UTD, including this one. Uh, it's things like, what, what is academic dishonesty? Okay, what does that mean? Well, it, I'll just tell you, it's a, euphemism, it's a euphemism for cheating. Okay, so, but the, but the policy is there. You should read it and be familiar with it. Hopefully it never comes up for in, for in this class. That'd be terrific. Uh, other things in there are like, what constitutes a uh, <coughs> university approved excuse for absence? Okay. Watching Game of Thrones is not a university approved absence, okay? Being physically incapacitated due to injury is, okay? And there's other, you read it to figure out what's in there. So another important item uh, in those syllabus policies is that uh, there's an office on campus called the Office of Student Accessibility. So uh, if you have, for example, say, uh, a hearing deficit or a visual deficit that needs to be taken care of either for lectures or for quizzes or something like that, then the OSA is who you would talk to to get that worked out. And then they would make a plan for how your lecture or quizzing might be modified and then I'll carry out that plan. Okay, that's what OSA is. Now, if you don't have any of that, then I'm just not talking to you. But for those of you that may have an OSA account, you the OSA told you, and I'll remind you, that the OSA does not disclose your, your, your account or your plan to me. Only you can disclose it to me, and if you don't disclose it to me, I will not know. Which means that, for example, if the OSA has, has made an accommodation for you that says you can take the quizzes in a, in a room with really bright lights, say, that's cool. We will make it happen. But if you only tell me halfway through the semester, then we'll make it happen from then on, but all the other stuff that you did before, sorry, you should have told me in advance. We're not going to redo it. Okay? So if you have OSA paperwork, please get it to me as soon as possible, even after today's lecture if you have it. Okay? And we'll, make, we'll make sure every accommodation is, uh, is made. So any questions about that? <clears throat> okay, so this is the tentative schedule. Okay, how we're going to go through the content of the textbook. So these <coughs> textbook sections correspond to this textbook, to this one. Okay, um, <coughs> it's pretty straightforward. Any question about, about this much? So there are three categories of assignments, okay, how, you, how your grade will be determined in this class. So one of them is online homework. That means my math lab. And that's what, that's what that means. So there are 21 lectures in this summer course, and this is one of them. So there's 21 lectures. Corresponding to every lecture will be a My Math Lab homework. So for example, we're going to get to some math in a few minutes, and then I'm going to make a My Math Lab homework tonight. And it's going to be due six days from now. 
So this is a Tuesday. It's going to be due Monday at 11.59 p.m., okay, one minute before midnight. The reason is because I want you to have done all of that material before we get to lecture on Tuesday. Okay, so all the way up to one minute before midnight. And there will be one of those for every lecture. So we'll, we'll lecture on Thursday. There will be another My Math Lab homework that's due Wednesday at 11.59 p.m., etc. There's going to be 21 My Math Lab homeworks. Any question about those? So the purpose of My Math Lab homework is more or less like drill. It's like drill. So if you've ever, if you've ever uh, like played on a soccer team, like when you were little, Okay, then one of the things that you do on a soccer team is the coach puts about eight or ten cones all in a row and then everybody lines up and the coach says, okay, everybody, dribble, dribble through the cones, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and then, but only use your left foot. Only use the outside of your left foot, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and you do that for five minutes and then, okay, now use only the inside of your left foot, in and out, in and out, in and out. Okay, that kind of thing. That's what my math lab is. Okay, and if it feels repetitive and boring, perfect, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're going for. Okay, the next category of homework is written homework. So, corresponding to every lecture will be between four and six written homework exercises. Okay, so that means that tonight I'm going to post between four and six written homework exercises. You'll download these these written homework exercises, one page each. You'll print one page for each of them. You'll do the exercises. You'll turn them in at the lecture seven days from that lecture. So what I'm telling you is that tonight I'm going to make between four and six written homework exercises and they're going to be due in seven days less 15 minutes at the beginning of lecture. Okay? And it's going to be that way for every lecture. So there's 21 lectures between four and six. Uh, that means that there's going to be, you know, on the order of 80 to 120 homeworks, written homework exercises. Okay? Any question about that? So, that means that in this week, we're lecturing over, over material. Next week is when the homeworks over that material is due. Okay? Then the next next week, that is to say, two weeks from now, there is a quiz. Corresponding to every lecture is a quiz. So, Monday, 13 days from now, okay, the Monday that is 13 days from now, a window will open. Monday, 13 days from now, to Saturday, 18 days from now. You must take quizzes one and two. Quiz one will be over this lecture, Quiz two will be over the next lecture. Okay, that, those quizzes are at the testing center. Okay, so that means that the way the semester goes is it's like in layers. Right now, we're lecturing this week. So this is week one, we're, doing, we're lecturing. Next week, you're gonna, be doing the, you're gonna be finishing the homeworks for this week. And then the next, next week, you're gonna be doing quizzes over the homework that you had turned in the previous week. Okay, so the way it will go is you'll turn in the written homeworks. And after they're turned in, I will post keys to the written homeworks. That is to say, PDFs and also videos. The keys will be posted. And then, after that's all done, I'm going to take all those questions, and from those questions, I'm going to make quizzes, which is to say that the written homeworks are like a preview of the quiz. Okay, so then by the time the quiz happens, you will have done online homework, you will have done written homework, the keys to the written homework, both PDFs and videos, will be posted, and then a few days later, the five-day window to take the quizzes opens. Okay, so any questions about the way it'll go? Yes? Um, for the quizzes, I only use the testing center for advanced for one class. Do we have to um, change any points online? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send a link about it. Other questions? Yeah? What are the percentage of all of these towards your final grade? 
The online homework is 15, the written homework is 15, and the quizzes are, thir are the balance, 70. I haven't gotten to the final yet. I'll explain what that means. <clears throat> but yes, the online homework is 15, written homework is 15, quizzes are 70. Now, back to there being no makeups. So, the online homework, you have a week in which to do it. Okay? Each one, you have a week. Six days, you have for each one. Um, so there's plenty of time to do it, and there's really no excuse for it not happening. That being the case, there's going to be 21 by the end of the semester. We're going to drop the lowest 10%. That is to say, we're going to drop the lowest two online homeworks. Now, the written homeworks, there's going to be like 80. I don't know how many there's going to be. We're just going to have to see. But supposing that there's 80, we're going to drop the lowest 10%, which means 8. We'll drop the lowest 8 of them. Okay. As for the quizzes, each, of the each quiz at the testing center will have three exercises on it. In fact, only two of the questions will be graded, but I will not advertise in advance which two will be graded because that means you have to sweat all three during the quiz. Okay, so then by the time the quiz is over, so there'll be two e graded exercises on each quiz, and there's only time, in fact, for I think 16 quizzes we can't make it all the way to 21 because, remember, quizzes are offset by two weeks. So we don't want to hang around for two more weeks, right, after the semester is over. Okay, so all those, all those questions will be taken on the final. But as for the quizzes that you're able to take before, before time runs out, okay, there's going to be on the order of like 30 graded quiz exercises. You will have taken 45 or so, but only 30 of them will be graded. The final exam will consist of two parts. One of the parts is a mandatory part, which everyone has to do. Okay? The other part is that for every one of those exercises, that the quiz has exercises that you has, was graded, so that'll be about 30 of them, there'll be, a, there'll be a little sheet of paper. So you may say like, well, you know, it'd be really nice if, if I could do better on quiz seven question two because I didn't do very well on it the first time. Well, there will be a sheet in the final exam named quiz seven question two, and you can redo it. And you'll be allowed to redo probably between eight and 10. So there'll be about 30 graded quiz exercises by the time of the final exam. You'll be able to do, redo about a third of them. Okay, and you can take the better of whichever one you did. So if you did better on the first go round, you can have that one. If you do better on the redo attempt, you can have that one. Okay, then the, the, the mandatory part, you're only gonna get one stab at those exercises. Okay, so what, so what I mean by no redos because there's slack built into the system? Okay, let's say that somehow you have an unfortunate se series of events that disallows you from taking quiz five because for five days in a row you were incapacitated <laughs> and couldn't go to the testing center. Five flats, five days in a row, <laughs> or whatever. Okay, then that means you're gonna get a zero on that quiz. That can be, you can do two redos to make up that quiz. You'll get a zero for the, for the first graded question, a zero for the second graded question, but on the final exam, you can redo them and you can make it up there. Okay, so then the lowest 10% of online homework will be dropped, the lowest 10% of written homework will be dropped, and you'll be able to redo approximately 25% of all the quiz questions. Because you'll be able to do about, redo about a third of them, and, and then the other ones are, you're gonna only see for the first time and the only time on the final exam. Okay, so there's lots of slack and, and redo opportunities. Okay, my, the reason for, for the redo thing is there's, there's two reasons, two big reasons. One reason is that I don't really care, my teaching philosophy is that I don't really care if you don't understand the material in, in week six. I mean, I, I don't like it, I'd rather you did, 
but it, it's kind of irrelevant to me if you didn't understand it in week six, but you do understand it by the time you exit. In the end, that's the only thing that I care about. So if you can show me that you understand it at the exit, then this is fine. Okay, the other thing is that that allows everyone to study very specifically for what would be best for them on the final exam. So for one student, maybe they need to study things on quizzes three, four, and five a lot. And another student, maybe they need to study quizzes eight, nine, and 10 a lot. Everybody has their own sort of customized study plan. Okay, any question about any of that? <clears throat> There's going to be, I think, 15 or 16 by the, time the, by the time the course runs up, by the time we run out of time. And um, so whenever we go to the testing center, there's already going to be two quizzes waiting for us to do. Mm -hmm. So you can just take one, or do you get both of them and just like, take both of them? You're going to have to make two different appointments, but you can schedule them back to back. Okay. So those are going to have three questions each. You'll have 30 minutes for each one. But if you're prepared, they should really probably only take 15 minutes, approximately. Other questions? OK, and then at the bottom is a joke. And then you, depending on how far you got in Applied Calculus 1, this might, this might be comprehensible <laughs> and funny and maybe not but by the end of next week we will be able to make sense of it whether or not it's funny is entirely a matter of taste I suppose okay so any questions before we get to math any questions I'll send you a message the calendar is already made in its entirety and you'll be able to of course. You'll be able to, you can, there's a link, you can, if you use a cell phone, a modern phone, you can just download it all into your phone. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, I write on these sheets, they say 17U which means the summer of 2017 according to UTD's terminology, Math 1326, Section 5U1. And then the date here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to cover uh, some various things from Applied Calculus 1. So this should all be reviewed this week. should all be reviewed. So there's two reasons for the review. One reason is that this, this particular step that we're going to review is important because it's going to come up again later. Uh, and so, so I want to make sure you know it. And another reason is that when you're getting used to a new teacher, it's sometimes nice for them to teach something that you already know so that you can figure out the way they talk while you're learning something that you already know. Okay? So, <clears throat> that being the case, I'll write REM here, which means I'm starting a remark. Okay? So, we're going to talk about exponentials. So let A be positive, not 1, and constant. Hard to read? It, get, it gets, let's see. That's better, huh? Okay. <clears throat> and then it does that. Okay. So uh, let, okay, blah, blah. The function
f of x is a to x is called uh, exponential base a. Okay, so a couple comments. So in the first place, just purely stylistic. When I'm, when I'm writing language, mm -hmm. English words, I write it in uppercase print so that you can look at those and say, oh, that's, that's, that's a word, right? That's not math, that's, a, that's not a math symbol, that's a word. Uh, whereas when I'm writing math symbols, I write them in a script font, if you like. Uh, so I'm not like losing my mind writing an A like that there and an A like that there. The distinction is, is that A is part of a word and that A is a numerical quantity. Okay, so that's just the stylistic convention to make it easier for you to understand what I'm uh, writing. So I have a question. Why is it that A needs to be not one? in order for this to be an exponential function. Yeah? Right. Let's consider the expression 1 to x. Well, what's 1 to 5? 1. How about what's 1 to 55? Also 1, right? So then the function 1 to x is a pretty boring function. It's always 1. It's, it's, it's just a horizontal line. And to be an exponential function, we want the, the result to either be always increasing or always decreasing, one or the other, always growing or always decaying. And uh, if, the base, if, if you made A 1, then it, w it wouldn't be doing that. So 1 is, is, is out of the question. Similarly, the base needs to be positive because we want, we want the expression a to x to work for all x's. <coughs> so, <coughs> for example, consider what if a was negative 1? If a was negative 1, then you, you could do like negative 1 to 10. What's negative 1 to 10? Positive 1, right? Because 10 happens to be an even integer. Okay, what's negative 1 to 101? Negative one, because 101 happens to be odd. However, what is, but we want it to work for all x. So what about, say, negative one to half? Well, what is, what is fractional exponent half? Square root. So negative one to half, that's square root of negative one. And that means some kind of thing some of the time in some places, but it has no real meaning here because this is the calculus of real variables. Okay, so then that's why we need the base to be positive. Because otherwise you can't make sense of the expression. A to x. <clears throat> okay. So there's two broad categories of exponential functions. <clears throat> and I'll categori categorize them by their base and how they look. <clears throat> As a result, so <clears throat> one of them will take the base to be between 0 and 1. So something in here might be something like 0 0.9 or um, <clears throat> half, or something like that. And then we'll take the other case to be uh, more than 1. <clears throat> Okay. <coughs> so without regard to, to either of those, every exponential function, when you plug in zero, you must always get a specific value. What value must you get when you plug in zero? You must get one. Because for example, what is say uh, two to exponent zero? One. What is a million to exponent zero? Also one, right? Also one. 
So that means that <coughs> all exponentials go through the point 0, 1. All of them must do that. <coughs> Okay, so the one on the, the, the case on the right is when people think of exponentials, that's the one they usually think of. <clears throat> so when the base is more than one, that means that, <clears throat> for example, we could take the base to be two, because the, two being an example of something more than one. That means that every time you move to the right one unit, you double. Since, since, it, since the base is 2. So since this is 1, if we move one unit to the right, what would the next output be? 2. And then one more unit to the right, the next output is 4. And then one more, that'd be 8. And then 16, 32, blah, blah, blah. So then that means you go to the right, and you're going up. But... <clears throat> if every time you move to the right one unit, if, if, if A is in fact 2, every time you move to the right one unit, you, go, you multiply by 2, then what happens if you move to the left? You divide by 2, right? Because if here, if here you're at 16 and you move 1 to the left, then you're at 8, then 4, then 2, then 1. So it goes like this to the left. <clears throat> so this is called exponential growth. <coughs> okay. How will this case, when the base is between zero and one, zero and one, look in comparison to this one? Sorry? What does it mean opposite? Okay, I like it. So that means that, for example, half is a number between 0 and 1. So that means that every time you move to the right, you multiply by the base. And if the base is half, here we're at 1. If we move 1 to the right, then we're at what? Half. And one more to the right, we're at a fourth. One more to the right, we're at an eighth, and then a sixteenth, and then a thirty-second, etc. So then that means that going this way, it is like that. So that I take it to mean that's what you meant by opposite, flipping it across that axis. So this one is called exponential growth. What's this one called? <clears throat> I think I heard someone whisper it. Exponential what? Decay. So to make sure that you kind of understand <clears throat> these, these come up a great deal, especially in our class. Uh, for example, related to money. But we're going to talk to we're going to talk about money in just a minute, so I'm going to use different examples. So, <coughs> a physical example of exponential growth, probably the go-to example, <coughs> is something like bacterial growth. So let's imagine for a moment that we've got we've got a petri dish. Which is to say an, an, an agar-filled petri dish, which is to say paradise for a bacterium. So we've got a completely sterile petri dish, uh, which means that we could, if, if we took that petri dish and it was completely sterile and we put it in a, in a sterile con container, no, nothing whatsoever would happen to it. It would just sit there and do nothing. Okay, then suppose that I take a single bacterium and put it in the dish. This is like paradise for a bacteria. Okay? So then <clears throat> the bacteria will consume the agar, the, the material, the media, and it will grow. And then once it reaches a certain size, the bacteria automatically decides, in scare quotes, that it's time to become two bacteria. Right? So it cleaves itself, and now you have two daughter cells, two bacteria. Okay? So now, the, formerly there was one, now there's two. 
in the dish. Then each one of these will consume the media in the dish, and each of them will grow, and each of them will decide, now it's time to be two. Except now these two each divide into two, and so how many are there now? Four, right? And then those grow, <coughs> and then they double, and then how many are there? Eight. Now, <coughs> let's say that this bacteria is a moderately fast-growing bacteria, and it is able to go through this particular cycle once an hour. That's not really that fast, as I understand it, for bacteria. So it's able to go through this cycle once an hour. So <clears throat> at time zero, I put a single bacterium in the dish. At one hour, there, there are two bacteria. At two hours, you add one hour, you double the bacteria. So one more hour, there's four. One more hour, there's eight. One more hour, there's 16. One more hour, there's 32. So now, that's like five hours or whatever. And there's 32 bacteria. Well, as it happens, I can't see a bacterium with my naked eye, and I can't see 32 of them either. <laughs> so you might think, that oh, doesn't seem like it's a real big deal. So let's consider now. What if, what if, what is the case after 32 hours, which is to say less than a day and a half? <clears throat> right? What's the case after 32 hours? How many bacteria are in the dish? Around 8 billion. More than the number of human beings on the planet. What about after 64 hours? Every one of those 8 billion would themselves have become a further 8 billion. So that means that it's 8 billion times 8 billion. That's a 64 with 18 zeros behind it. That's enough, that's enough to see, <laughs> that's enough to see from across the room. Okay, you don't need a microscope. <clears throat> okay, so then don't be misled by thinking, oh, after five hours, there's only 32 of them. Well, yeah, but after, a, <laughs> after two days, the, the whole thing is gone. You've, they've consumed everything in there. Okay, that's the reason why when you're driving on the highway and you see those animals on the side of the road, none of them ever look good. Okay, in the first place, they were hit by a car. That, that's, that's a strike against them. Okay, in the second place, all of those animals and, and, and all of us, all creatures, are just totally and completely covered inside and out with bacteria. There's more bacteria, organisms, on and in your body than there are your own cells. <laughs> that's a, an interesting thought, huh? And your, your body is, in fact, at all times waging a war to keep them in check from just consuming you. That's why after, after about a day of, of being deceased, your body is, like, uh, is, is starting to become bloated and rigid because you're just being eaten up by all those bacteria that were on you already. After two days, after two days, there's, there's like, you know, one, there's a one with 20 zeros behind it, more bacteria on your body. Because <laughs> they're just eating you up. Okay, so that's, that's exponential growth. <clears throat> okay, from one to lots and lots. Okay, for exponential decay, <clears throat> there's a, here's a different physical example. It's probably the most common physical example for, for that. Uh, so in physics and chemistry, you know, it's been, a, it's been an important discovery that everything is made of atoms. And all, the, all, the, all of the baryonic matter is made of atoms, all the stuff that we interact with. Uh, so all of the atoms are arranged on a table, the periodic table. And the character of an atom is entirely determined by what? So what makes gold gold, and what makes carbon carbon? The number of protons. That's it. 
Okay? So carbon, for example. How many protons does carbon have? Six. It has six. But besides protons, what else can be in the nucleus? Neutrons. Okay? Then the sum of the number of protons and neutrons is called the atomic mass. The most common kind of carbon is carbon-12. The kind of carbon that has six protons, because it simply must, because it wouldn't be carbon otherwise, and six more neutrons. But not all carbon has six neutrons. There's another fairly common kind of carbon that has eight neutrons, and it's called carbon-14. So different atoms, different specific atoms, can have different number of neutrons. What are those called? Isotopes, right? So the isotopes of carbon. So you may have heard of carbon dating to figure out how, something, how old something is. Well, that's a measurement of how much carbon-12 there is to how much carbon-14 there is, because carbon-14 happens to be fairly unstable, and it will decay into things that are not carbon. Interesting. So let's talk about a different element. There's another element called uranium. Uranium has on the order of 90 protons. I think it's 92? I don't know. I'm not a chemist. Uh, but the kind of ur uranium is really exciting because it has so many protons in it that it means it's pretty unstable, actually. Unstable enough to make nuclear weapons. Okay, so then if you're clever enough to get a lot of uranium together, the right kind of isotope together, then you can make a weapon. Okay, so U-235 is, is uranium-235. It is the uranium that if uranium has 92 protons, I'm not sure about that, then U-235 has 235 minus 92 neutrons in it. That's how many it has. Lots and lots of neutrons. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that somehow we were able to procure exactly a, a, a one kilogram brick of uranium-235. And let's ignore for the minute that that would be exceptionally dangerous right, for such a situation to have occurred. Well, uranium-235 is, is quite unstable, and its half-life is, I believe, on the, uh, on the order of 93,000 years. Let's round that to 100,000 for the sake of argument. What that means is that if we had a kilogram brick of U-235, and if we all just sat here patiently and waited, for 100,000 years, and we took another look at that brick, there would still be a kilogram of material there, but only half of it would be U-235. The other half of it would have changed into other elements in a decay process eventually ending in lead. So approximately half of the brick would be lead, and the other half would be U-235. We'd still have a kilogram of material, more or less. So if we waited around another 100,000 years, then how much U-235 would there be? A quarter of a kilogram, half of half. And the rest of it would be lead, more or less. If we waited another 100,000 years, how much would there be? One-eighth of a kilogram. So now, suppose that, suppose that we, we did this experiment and we lost track of time, but then we measured it and we discovered, oh, there's one over 32 kilograms of U-235 here. Then how long has it been? 500,000 years. Five half-lives have occurred. Okay? And this is the reason why we know that the Earth is four billion years old. Because when when lava has a certain amount of U-235 in it, okay, and when it, when it freezes and makes a rock, the U-235 is now trapped. It can't leave. And neither can its decay products of lead. So you can take a rock, you can take a rock, and you can determine how old it is by measuring its U-235 isotope to lead ratio and just work backwards and figure out the number of half-lives that must have occurred. Incredible. That's exponential decay. Any question about this? It's the exact same thing with carbon-14, is that living things that are exposed to the atmosphere and the sun 
take in a certain amount of carbon-14 by, by virtue of being exposed to the sun. But when things die and are buried, they're not exposed to the sun anymore, and the carbon-14 decays till there's eventually none. So you can determine the age of something by measuring its carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio. Any questions about this? <clears throat> Good. So now, we're going to talk about simple interest. So suppose that we have a principal deposit, principal deposit amount P, and that we have annual interest rate R. Uh, and that we have number of years <coughs> t, <coughs> t. <coughs> then I equal to PRT is the simple interest. So I'd like to warn you just slightly that this is in no way connected to the way things work in reality. <laughs> So <clears throat> this is the following kind of story. It would be like I say right now that, OK, I'm opening a bank. And I offer 5% interest, simple interest. And um, that would mean that if, if right now you, you put a deposit of $100, and I held your $100 for a year, then at the end of that year, I would write a check for $5 and send it to you in the mail. And then you would receive it. And then if I held it for another year, I'd write another check for $5 and send it to, to, to you, and you'd get it. And then we could do it over and over and over for as many years as you like. i just send you a $5 check. Okay, That's what this is. Okay, That's not at all connected to the way money works in real life. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So the way this works is it's like, here's, here's the bank account that's at interest rate R. You take your principal deposit, you put it in, and then every year you get a payment of PR. Every year. So in real life, that's not the way bank accounts work. How do bank accounts work in real life? Besides that. Yeah, and, and uh, the way bank accounts actually work is they don't, actually, they don't write a check and send it to you. What do they do? They put it back in your account. So that instead of having a $100 principal balance, you'd have 105. Right? So then that would be like in this diagram taking this arrow and putting it back in the box. Okay, but we're going to ignore that for the time being. So suppose that <clears throat> suppose that um, <clears throat> I give you uh, suppose we have a principal amount uh, deposit of one three two six. <clears throat> For eight years, uh, get yields an interest payment of five hundred dollars. What was the rate? as a percent. Well, okay. 
Let's consider. This is the model. How many parameters are in this model? Four. So that means on an exercise such as this, it must be the case that I've given you all but one and asked you to find the other. Right? If it was a model with 12 parameters, then I'd have to give you 11 and say, find the other one. It just it couldn't be any other way. OK. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let's write them all down. So I, is this something that we know, or is this something we're supposed to find? Is, we're so which one is it? It's 500, right? We were given that. OK. So the next one is P. Is this something that we know, or is this something that we're supposed to find? Yeah, it's 1326. By the way, whenever I need some silly number and I'm just making stuff up, I'll probably use that number. Why am I going to use that number? Because that's the course number, right? And that's one of the running jokes in a math class. <laughs> you, you always use the year or the course number or whatever. So then R, is, is that something that we know or is that, what, or is that something we're supposed to find? Yeah, we're supposed to find this one, right? Because it says, what was the rate as a percent? So this we find. Uh, and then T, is this something we know or something we're supposed to find? It's eight. So now, was it, was it true that we were given all but one and instructed to find the last one? Yeah. Okay. So any question about, we haven't solved it yet, but is there any question about getting to this? So now it's just a matter of plugging stuff in. <clears throat> So we know that's the model ISPRT. So 500 <coughs> is 1326 multiplied by R multiplied by 8. So now we just need to solve for R. So then 500 divided by 1326 times 8 is R. <coughs> that looks like a job for a calculator. So uh, this is saying that R is 0 0.04713, and then some more digits. Is that the answer? Why not? Uh, it wants it to be a percent. So what is this number as a percent? 4.7%. Any question about this? <clears throat> Any question about it? Okay, so then you can imagine, right? There's only so many combinations I can do, right? <laughs> I, just, I just choose any one of them. Okay, that's the one you're going to find. And then I just choose some random numbers for the other three. And then I make up some story about it. Okay, so let's see. Uh, how does interest work in more realistically. So more real, realistically, you have this thing, compound interest. <clears throat> and now you have uh, more, more things to consider. So we've got a principal deposit. P, principal deposit P. Uh, we've got an annual interest rate. R. And now to be more realistic, that is to say like the banks. Okay? If you have a savings account and it says annual interest rate of say 
24%. <laughs> By the way, if you have such a thing, just leave and just put all your stuff in there. <laughs> just uh, sell everything and put it in there. Okay. Um, now, if you have a savings account that says annual interest rate 24%, does that mean that once per year the bank reckons interest and gives you 24%? Is that how the banks do it? How do they do it? They don't do it once per year. How, when do they do it? Once a month, right? Once a month. So if you, had a tw if you have a 24% account, then interest is actually reckoned once a month. And so what is 24 divided by 12? Two, which is why I chose 24, so I could divide it by 12. Okay. The way, the way it effectively works is that you get a 2% interest per month. That's what really happens. That's what really happens. That's what 24% annual interest rate means. So you have another parameter, the number of compoundings <clears throat> per year. in. So in the case of monthly, that means n is 12. In the case of weekly, that means n is 52. In the case of fortnightly, <laughs> that means 26, because everyone knows that a fortnight is two weeks, right? <laughs> no, I'll never use that in an exercise. That'd be terrible. But quarterly, okay, that means n is 4. Okay. Then you have the number of years. <clears throat> T. So you've got this extra parameter, um, N. So the way that this actually works now is that the current account balance at time zero, you put a principal deposit in to the account. that has rate R. And its current account balance is A. The current account balance is not the same as the initial deposit because every time interest is reckoned, more money is added in. Okay, So then that <clears throat> what actually gets added in is you take whatever the current account balance is, A, and you multiply it by R and you add that much in. So. If we had a 5% account and the current balance was $100 and we're going to reckon 5% on, on, this, on this accrual, on this compounding, that means how much is going to be added in? If you had $100, 5%. $5 is going to be added in. What's the new account balance? 105. So now what's 5% of 105? Six dollars, right? Because, because no, that's not right. Is it? No. Five percent of five dollars is. <laughs> brain is not not working. Twenty-five cents, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So five twenty-five is going to be added in. So the first time, you, five dollars is deposited. <coughs> then five dollars and twenty-five cents is deposited. The next time. And then approximately $5.31 is deposited the next time. Or more, more than that. I don't know. I'm losing track of it. But every time your account balance goes up, and now you're reckoning 5% of the new account balance. OK? So let's calculate a few of these. Let's see how this works. So if the current account balance was, <coughs> pardon me, was P. Because that's the first thing that you did. Then after one interest accrual, it will be P plus PR. Right? Because it was, it's, you have 100% of what you had plus the, int plus the rate times the plus, t plus the rate times what you had. So now, 
Uh, in fact, we need to write over n or over n because that's like 24% divided by 12 because that's per month, right? So then now, in this expression, do you see that there's a common term, a common factor, a p, right? So let's factor out that p. That would be p multiplied by what? 1 plus r over n. Now, I want to convince you that that makes sense because that means that, well, if you had p dollars, then after the interest is reckoned, you're going to have all the money that you had previously plus a little more. So if this was a 5% account, this number in parentheses would be a 105%, 1.05. That's what this would be. If it, were, if, if, it was, if it was a 3.8%, this would be uh, 1.038. That's what this number would be. That would, that would, that would stand for 103.8%. So now, let's say we do this again. So this step one, step two, step three. So we have that much, p multiplied by 1 plus r over n. That's how much we have. And to that, we're going we're gonna to add p multiplied by 1 plus r over n, and then multiplied by r over n. Because what this, this represents how much money we have, and then how much money we have times the interest fraction. So now, do you observe in this expression that something is common? What is common? Yeah, that whole thing, right? So, so all of that red can be factored out. Can be factored out. So if we were to factor it out, that would be p multiplied by 1 plus r over n. And then my question to you is, is what needs to go in here to complete the factoring out? What is it? Yeah, for this, for this one, <clears throat> for this one, if you factor p, plus, p times 1 plus r over n out of this, then what do you get? A 1. So you get a 1. And then if you factor p plus a p times 1 plus r over n out of all of that, what do you get? An r over n. So you get r over n here. Now. What I'd like for you to observe is that the round parentheses and the square parentheses are really just the same thing. So how can I write that more simply? Squared. Just squared, right? So p multiplied by 1 plus r over n squared. Now I claim that, I, that you should reckon this as being obvious now because if we had a 5% account and we held $100 in it for a month and it was 5% a month, that'd be incredible, wouldn't it? <laughs> then at the end of a month, th then you'll have $105 because you're multiplying your balance by 1.05 then at the end of the next month, the new balance will be that balance times 1.05. And at the end of another month, it'll be that times 1.05. So what will the next one be? What will it be? Well, I claim we don't need to do any more work. You can, you can tell me what the pattern is. Mm-hmm. P multiplied by 1 plus r over n cubed. So if we went through 48 interest periods, then it would be P times 1 plus r over n to 48. That's what it would be. So taking this to the conclusion, therefore, 
the formula that relates all of those things together is A is equal to P multiplied by 1 plus R over N to N T. That's the formula. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> in a bank account, let's suppose that everything is, f that, that the interest rate is fixed, right, that it doesn't, it's not a variable rate, it's fixed. And that the number of compoundings per year is also fixed, right? It's monthly, for now, and forever. Okay? But the only thing that actually changes is how long you keep your money in the account, right? That's up to you. You might wonder, how much would I have after one year? How much would I have after 37 years? That means that the only variable is T. That means that this, this number right here in round parentheses is a constant. That P is a constant. And that T is the only variable, which means this is an exponential function, which is why this consideration always comes immediately after you talk about exponentials, because that's what this is. So just like the bacteria grow quickly, so does money. <laughs> and, it, and, and, and that's a double-edged sword, because then so does debt, right? Okay, so if you have an account and it's bearing interest, then, you, then after every month, you're multiplying it by something. Just like after every hour, you multiply the number of bacteria by two. After every month, you multiply your money by 1.0. 1, 6, or what, whatever it is. You multiply it by something. And after not too many months, it accumulates a lot. But so does your debt, right? <laughs> because if, say, you took out $1,000 so you could pay for UTV, okay, then that, that may mean that, okay, well, the bank says, we let you use that 1000 but now that it's been a month, we're charging you interest. Now you owe us 1005 And then, for the next month, they're going to charge you interest on the 1005 <laughs> Which And so maybe your new account balance will be $1,010.04 or whatever. I have no idea. And then now they're going to charge you interest on $1,010.04. So your debt accumulates just as quick as your wealth. Okay. So any question about this? How many model how many parameters are in this model? Five. So if I were to ask you a question about this, that means that I'd have to give you four and ask you to find the last one. That'd have to be the way it is. Okay? So you've already done that kind of thing lots of times before this class, so I'll ignore that for a moment. Now, <clears throat> back to exponentials for a moment. <clears throat> Now, all exponentials, every single one of them, has to go through the same point. What point do they all have to go through? Zero, one. No matter what the exponential is, if you input zero, the output must be one. Now, <clears throat> let's say that this is a picture of two to x. So a picture of 2 to x. My question to you is, is how will 3 to x look in comparison to this one? Steeper. It'll be steeper on the growth side. Because, for example, if you plug in 4 into 2 to x, what is 2 to 4? Not one less. 16. 2 to 4 is 16. What's 3 to 4? 81. So that means that by the time you're four units to the right on 2 to x, you're at 16, but 3 to x is already at 81. 3 to x is going up real quick, right? So 3 to x 
looks something like this on this side. It's going up real, real quick. But what's happening on the decay side? So it's above on this, on, on this side, but what's happening on the other side? It's below, right? It's below because, because if this is one, for the red, which is, which is, which when you move to the right on the red, you multiply by two. When you move to the left on the red, you divide by two. So when you move one to the left on the red, you're at half. Where are you on the green? One third. If you move two to the left on the red, you're at a fourth. But if you move two to the left on the green, you're at a ninth. So the green is going down quite quick. So it's under on this side. So they switch positions right there. Now, <clears throat> here's an interesting fact, is that nature itself pre prefers, has a preference uh, for a base. It has a preference. And nature actually doesn't like 2 as a base, doesn't like 2 dex. It's too slow. This porridge is too cold. Uh, and it doesn't like 3 dex. It's too fast. This porridge is too hot. What is the base that nature prefers? Which one? It, it's written as E, the natural base, the natural number. So there is a number. <clears throat> E is 2.7182818284590.45, and that's all that I can ever remember. So it's about 2.7. So if we were to plot the natural exponential, where would it fall on this drawing? be in between them, right? It'd be in between the red and the green. Would it be closer to one of them? It'd be closer to the green one, right? It'd be closer to 3 to x for the simple reason that 2.7 is closer to 3 than it is to 2. So, <clears throat> nature's exponential, the exponential that nature prefers, looks like this. So this is e to x. Now that's a pretty tall order, a pretty tall claim, to say that nature prefers something. Right? Why should it be that way? Why should it be that way? So now I'm going to ex convince you that, in fact, e must be important. So there's another constant that I think we can all agree has, has significance. Uh, how about the circle constant, pi, okay. which is the, which is, what is pi? Well, yes, it's about 3.14, but what is it with regard to any circle? Uh, but it's not, it, I mean, that, that is a fact, but, but that's not related to, um, that's not, re that's not actually what pi comes from. I mean, I agree that pi, that when measured in degrees angularly, pi is equivalent to 180. I agree with that. <clears throat> well, let's try and remember, what's the formula for the circumference of a circle? That's the area. Circumference is 2 pi r. Okay, and then what is 2 r? So the r is radius, right? So what is twice r? Diameter. So the circumference is pi multiplied by the diameter. Right? So if you divide the circumference of a circle by its diameter, that's pi. That's why it's called the circle constant. Is you can draw any circle that you want, a little itty bitty one, and then measure its circumference and its diameter and compute the ratio, it's pi. You could draw a really, really big circle, as big as the Milky Way. 
compute its, measure its circumference, measure its diameter, compute the ratio. 3.14 every time. Doesn't matter how big the circle is. It's intrinsic to the universe. It doesn't matter if you measure it here or there, big or small. It doesn't matter. It's intrinsic. Pi. E is just as intrinsic. Let's see why. So one of the reasons why <clears throat> So now I'm going to draw another e to x. But I'm going to draw it down here because that one up there is a little cluttered now. So <clears throat> every exponential must go through this point, 0, 1. And then e to x does something like this. Now, you've taken calculus, 1. So then you can tell me, what is the geometric interpretation of the value of the derivative of a function at a point? What is it? Almost. Slope of the tangent, right? Slope of the tangent line. So before you got here, you knew what a tangent line was. So what I want you to do is take your, your drawing, if you happen to draw one. Take your drawing and draw the tangent line at that point, at 0, 1. Okay, so what is it? And then have a look at what it looks like. <clears throat> okay, remember what the tangent line is. The tangent line is the best linear approximation of a function at a point, which is to say, if you were on this, this blue function and that big green dot wasn't there, obscuring everything. But you were at that position of the big green dot. And then you, were, you shrank really, really small in comparison to the blue function. How would the function look? It would look like a straight line if you were small enough. In the same sense that the Earth, when you get like out in the plains of Kansas, really super flat, and there's nothing around, and you look around, how does the Earth look to you? It looks flat. If you've ever been on the, on the ocean, on a boat, <laughs> but near the surface of the ocean, not way up high, it looks just as flat, if, as long as it's not a lot of waves. Flat is a really good approximation for the Earth for human-sized creatures. Really. For example, for this building, I'm quite sure that the engineers did not take into account the curvature of the Earth when they built it. It's not relevant. Okay, now, if you wanted to build a building the size of, say, Dallas-Fort Worth, like all of it, <laughs> then the curvature of the Earth would start to become relevant by a few feet. It really would. Maybe, maybe a few tens of feet, actually. But, but for this building, it's irrelevant. So we draw the tangent line. Here's the tangent line. Now, all of these exponentials have a tangent line. They all do, right? The, the 2 to x has its tangent line. 3 to x has its tangent line. e to x has its tangent line. They've all got their tangent line. But e to x is the only one, the one and only, whose tangent line has slope 1. It's the only one. So what I'm telling you is that 2 to x, 2 to x has, has, a, has a tangent line at 0, 1, but its slope is a little less than 1. And 3 to x has, has its own tangent line at 0, 1, but its slope is a little more than 1. It's a little more. e to x is the only one that has slope 1. And that's one, of the, that's one of the reasons why it's so important. It's the only one that does that. Because, for example, what is the here, here's, here's one of the reasons why this, is, why this is special, is that what is the derivative of e to x? e to x. It's the only function in the world that does that, in the universe. That's it. 
a constant times e to x is the only function who, that is its own derivative. What's the derivative of 2 to x? Did y'all do that in, in applied calculus 1? I'm getting blank stares now. No? So the derivative of 2 to x is 2 to x multiplied by the logarithm of 2. So you're getting this junk logarithm of 2 floating around. But you don't get this junk floating around for the natural base. Okay. Now, as, a, as something that's going to be slightly non sequitur, it, at least at first it will seem that way. I want you to consider <clears throat> the following thought experiment. We're going to take our model, the compound interest model, which has these five parameters like so. A is P multiplied by 1 plus R over N to NT. And now I'm going to say, okay, I'm opening up a bank. And we're going to have the following terms is that I will accept deposits of exactly one dollar, more, no more and no less. And the interest rate is 100%, I insist. I won't take any other rate. And the, the contract term is exactly one year. I won't do any more or any less, which means that if you open the account right now, in one year's time, it will terminate and the contract will be over. So if we were to do exactly one compounding, <coughs> on your one dollar at 100 percent at the end of one year and when the contract closes how much money will I hand back to you? Two dollars. The dollar that you gave me and a hundred percent of that dollar I held. So you'll, I'll give you back two dollars <clears throat> if we do exactly one compound. What if we do exactly two compounding? That is to say, I hold it for six months, I compound then, and then, and then I, hold it for the next, I hold the new balance for six months and compound then. So let's do it. So if it's one dollar and I've held it for six months, how much interest is going to be assessed at that time? 50% 50, 50%, right? Because we're going to do two compoundings, so it's 100% over two. So we assess 50%. What's 50% of a dollar? 50 cents, right? <laughs> so now what's your account balance? Dollar fifty. And now I'm going to hold that for six months. And then at the end of that six months, we're going to assess how much? 50%, right? What's 50% of a dollar fifty? 75 cents. So then I'm going to add that into the account and close your account out and hand you the money back. What's your account balance? 225. So all other things being equal, I'll assume that you prefer more money rather than less. Therefore, you, you prefer two compoundings over one. Two is better, because 225 is more than two. So now, <clears throat> we could do it like every month, right? That would mean that how many compoundings would there be? 12, right? So that means we do that, we do that process 12 times, okay? So now, here's, here's the thought experiment we're gonna go to. I'm gonna let you choose whatever end that you want. You can choose one, you can choose uh, 12, that would be once a month. What about uh, every day? And let's say it's a leap year, so 366, okay? What would that mean? Okay, well, that, what that means numerically is that because I only allow you to deposit one, one dollar, what is, which parameter am I talking about? P. So we're saying let P be one, and if I say I insist that it's a 100% interest rate, what parameter are we talking about? R. And what is its value? One. Right? Because what is 100% written as a decimal? One. Let P be one, let R be one, and then furthermore I stipulate that the contract is exactly one year. So what is that talking about? T. So T is one. So what I'm saying is 
is let's consider the case when all of those, when those three parameters are what? And let's write down the formula. So what would the formula be if we substituted one for those three values? The left hand side would be A, because it's unchanged. So what would the right hand side be? Yeah, one plus one over N, and then to what? Right, to N. Okay, and what I want to consider, let, let's make a table of values. So values of N and A. So we've already done two of them in our head. So if we do just one compounding, then what should A be? We already decided, we already said what A should be. It should be two. Let's, let's type that into the calculator and see if the universe is just. <coughs> so that means that into the calculator, I need to type this expression with N is one. So there'd be one plus one over one and then raised to exponent one. Okay, and we should get two. Okay, good. So we did it with we, we did it out loud for two compoundings. That means I should be able to I should be able to plug in two for n right there. Okay, so that means one plus one over two to exponent two. And what should we get? Okay, 225, good. And then we said, well, what about uh, every month? And we said, oh, that would mean n is 12. Let's plug that into the calculator. So that means I need to type 1 plus 1 over 12 raised to exponent 12. And that is 2.61. Oh, I like this, right? Because remember what the thought experiment is is that um, <clears throat> 613, blah, blah, blah. The thought experiment is, is that I, I'll let you do any number of compoundings that you want. Right? We can do it every day. We do it every second, every nanosecond, as far as I'm concerned. And net, nanosecond is a really short amount of time, in case you weren't aware. So let's think about that for just a minute. Here, here's a nice factoid, is that what's the fastest thing in the universe? Light, that's, that's the rule. Light and causation, causality, simply cannot travel faster, okay? Super fast. How far does light travel in a nanosecond? Like a mile or? 25 centimeters about 10 inches. In a nanosecond, light travels about that far. A nanosecond is a really short amount of time. There's lots of nanoseconds in a year. Okay, so, so we got, if we do it every nanosecond, if we do it every month, then I'll hand you back $2.61. So it's going up. So who thinks we can get it over $5? Maybe? Over five dollars? What about over five hundred? Could we? Because because I'm willing to do it every nanosecond, whatever you like. Cut off. Will it cut off? Like at five hundred or something? No, more like it looks like it's going to cut off. You think? Let, so let's type it in. So let's do some really big number that's not so big that I can't that I won't blow up my calculator. Let's do like a hundred million. So for those of you that want to connect that to something in real life, there's about 31 million seconds in a year. So this, is, this would be like compounding it every one-third of a second for a year, okay? <clears throat> so let's type it in. So one plus one over 100 million. One, two, three, one, two, three. Raised to exponent, one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? So I typed it in, and here we go. Okay, so let's write that down. So that's <laughs> surprising, right? 2.718, 28, uh, 18, 18, 18, 18, 15, blah, blah, blah. Wait a second. 
Do you recognize this number? What number is that? That's the natural number. <laughs> That's what it is. It's the end of this thought experiment. <clears throat> is that if we did this and you said, well, I want you to do it every nanosecond or whatever. And, and then I want you to do it every picosecond. Whatever, whatever you like. You'll never get more than E dollars from me. E dollars is the absolute maximum. So, as a result, <clears throat> we now have two compounding formulas. We have the discrete compound, the, the, the compounding formula that we will retroactively name the discrete compounding formula. Because the compoundings occur at discrete positions, usually 12 times per year. And then we also have the continuous model which is the logical consequence of letting the number of compoundings become infinite. And when you carry out the calculus to do that, this is what happens. Is it's <clears throat> the principle multiplied by the natural exponential of RT. And this is called the continuous model. Continuous. And this is the logical consequence of what happens when you let n become infinite. And for reasons that I suspect are obvious, this one is usually called the PERT formula. Okay. Any question about this? So, so how many parameters are in this model? Five. There's five in this model. How many parameters are in this one? Four, but I see five letters. Ah, but one of them is constant, right? E is a constant. It's not a parameter. Okay, so if, if we were dealing with a money problem, and we said compounding continuously, blah, blah, blah. That would, that would tell you that this is the model you're dealing with. If it's saying compounding every month, then you're dealing with this one. If you're dealing with a continuous model, I necessarily must have given you three parameters and be asking you to find the fourth. Okay, any question about this? So for all these reasons, the natural number is in fact intrinsic to the universe and is quite important. Okay, in, this, in the same way that pi is intrinsic to the universe and important. Okay. So now, we're going to switch gears a little bit and move to a different calculus topic. We're going to talk about derivative. So, we've got a picture here. So this is the plot of some function y is f of x. <clears throat> okay, and remember that sort of the, the con conceptual idea of a function is it's a machine that, that you give it inputs and it produces for you outputs. So you give it an input and then there's an output. So let's suppose that we have this particular input at C. So the horizontal axis are the, are the inputs and the vertical axis are the outputs. Uh, you can 
you can measure the output of the function by taking this vertical line where all the x's are c's and then you can measure ah that's the point right there that gives you a point on the function and then now you can take this over to the horizontal axis or to the to the other axis measure it over here and then because this function is named f and because that input is C, what is this output? So what's the name of the output? F of C. <clears throat> All right, so if you give it a C, out comes an F of C. If you gave it, if you gave it a, uh, a T, out would come an F of T. A giraffe, out comes an F of giraffe, right? Anything you put in there, f of that thing. So now let's suppose that we take this input and we move to the right a little bit, say to this input. That input right there. Well, visually we could do the same thing. And say, ah, there it is. Okay, and let's say that we, we actually measure this horizontal distance between these two fence posts. I'll call them fence posts. So let's say that we measure this horizontal distance and that we actually measure it to be delta x. So that distance is delta x. <clears throat> that means what is this x value here? C plus delta x. Right? Because we started at C and then we moved over a distance of delta x. Okay. <clears throat> so now we can take this one back to the vertical axis. And you should be able to tell me what is this output? Yes, f of c plus delta x. So now, if we, if we call this horizontal distance delta x, and if we're going to have an egalitarian notation, then what are we going to call this vertical distance? So if this one's delta x, then what's this one? Yeah, delta y. Okay, so now that delta looks like a triangle. It is a triangle, uh, visually. But it's actually a letter, not from our alphabet. What, what alphabet is it from? Greek, right? And it's phonetically equivalent to what letter in our alphabet? Which one? D, yeah. It makes the same, when, when, when a Greek-speaking person pronounces a delta, it sounds just like Okay, so uh, terrific. So we've got we we've got these things. So now we have two points on the graph. Now, between any two points whatsoever, you can draw a line. So now I'm going to draw the line which passes through those two points. <clears throat> So now, <coughs> that line, you take two points on a function and draw the line that passes through them. That line is common enough in science and math to have its own given name. What is the name of a line that passes through two points of a function? Which one? Not quite. Yeah, it's the, it, it, it is the hypotenuse of this particular right triangle. But when you draw, when you draw uh, through two points on a function, it has a specific name. It's not that, but it's like that. Which one? Secant. This is called the secant line. Now, 
That's called a secant line. Any two points on a function, secant line. <clears throat> so now what I want you to consider is what is the slope of that secant line? Well, it's got to be rise over run, right? That's what the slope of any line is. And we've already said that the rise is called delta y and the run delta x. So the slope of the secant line is, well, it's delta y over delta x. But we can relate that back to f by calculating what actually is delta y. What is delta y? Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the difference between these two values. It's the, it's the top one minus the bottom one. So this would be f of c plus delta x minus f of c, and then all of that over delta x. That's the slope of the secant line. OK. <coughs> so any question about this? Secant. So now, here, what I want you to imagine is the following. There's two fence posts. There's the one and the other. So now, I'm going to pin down this input so that it cannot move. That means that this particular graphite point is not moving. But now I want you to imagine that this, gra this diagram is mobilized, and I can grab it and wiggle this fence post around. And you would, you would witness this little graphite point sliding up and down the red function. It would be sliding up and down. And then you'd see the secant line wiggling back and forth, tracking that graphite point. So it's all wiggly and doing its thing. Okay. So now what I want you to imagine is I grab this, this fence post on the right, this input, and I start pushing it toward the first input so that this graphite point is sliding down and getting closer and closer to the first graphite point. Okay? And I want you to imagine what would be the end result of that procedure, supposing that I squished the two inputs to be right on top of each other. You would watch this graphite point slide down to be on top of that one. And you would watch this secant line slide down and come to rest at a particular location with a particular slope. And what's the name of that? That line, the, the end result. Because now there's just one point, so it's not a secant line. Now it's called a tangent line. So if <coughs> we now do that, So now that there's just one graphite point, the resulting line looks something like this. Yes, that is what you claimed. That is the tangent line. Now, a brief warning. For those of you who have taken a trigonometry or pre-calculus course, you might have connected, observed that, wait a minute, I know of a trigonometric function called tangent. And I think I remember a trigonometric function called secant. Well, there are trigonometric functions called tangent and secant. And that might further lead you to, to believe, ah, oh, that, that, these must be related. 
And they're not. <laughs> not really. Indirectly. What they're, what they're really related through actually is a, is a, probably the best one is just to say linguistically. So the, the word secant means to cut or a cut. So like, for example, a section in a book, or even more to the point, how about dissect, which means to cut in two. So this is called the secant line because it's cutting here and there, cutting through the function. So it's called a secant line. Whereas what does the word tangent mean? What does tangent mean? It means... So if secant means cut, then tangent means touch. It's the line that touches. It doesn't cut, it touches. Okay, so, so <clears throat> this is the tangent line. And if you draw a particular diagram of the unit circle, then the secant trigonometric function can be, can be a certain cut of the circle and the tangent trigonometric function can be a certain touch of the circle. So they're related, but not directly. Uh, now, what's the, what is the slope of the tangent line then? Well, we said that the, that the thought experiment was you're gonna hold uh, that point fixed and then move that input to the left until it's on top of that one. Which is to say that this distance, delta x, is, is going to get as close to zero as we want. Now, what is the name of the calculus procedure to make a quantity become as close to zero as you want? Limit, right? Limit. So, so the slope of the tangent line is the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x. That's the slope of the tangent line and is in fact the definition of derivative. Now if you replace the delta y's with f's, then that's the limit as delta x goes to zero of f of c plus delta x minus f of c over delta x. That's the slope of the tangent line. <clears throat> so now, one, one name <coughs> of this, the short name, is f prime of c. And that's what you probably wrote most of the time in calculus one. But there's another name that's frequently used for this. And I, I just, I have to say it because it's one of the oldest and funniest jokes in math. Is that <laughs> so? Delta is from which alphabet? Greek. Greek, right? And then we've got our alphabet that we call the English alphabet, but in fact, it's a very, very close derivative of actually a, di and I don't mean calculus derivative, I mean descendant. It's a very close descendant of another alphabet. Ultimately, where does the English alphabet come from? Latin. Latin. Okay. So the Latin alphabet, the very minor modifications of the Latin alphabet gives you the English alphabet. So <laughs> when you compute the limit of delta y over delta x as delta x goes to zero, <laughs> what happens is, is that the Greek letters become Latin letters. What was the phonetic equivalent of delta in Latin? A D. So what does this become after the limit? It becomes dy over dx, which is, which is what you were writing that whole time in calculus one. And it's really just a big joke. Ha <laughs> after, ha, after, after limit you switch alphabets from Greek to Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just a bad joke. Okay, <clears throat> so 
So any question about the meanings of these things that you, this is, this is like all of calculus, nearly all of calculus one, right here on this page. Like the whole, the, 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 the center of all of it. So you learned how to, how to compute, given a certain expression, how to compute uh, certain derivatives. So I could ask, for example, um, could you, could you compute the derivative of, say, 3x to 5 plus 4x uh, plus 9? So what is it? Right, 15x to 4, because that's the derivative of that, using the power rule and other things. And then the derivative of 4x is 4, and then what's the derivative of 9? 0. So I'll write plus 0, but only because it's the first time, and no, you don't need to write plus 0. Okay? So now, you learned a, you learned a, a multitude of such derivative rules. You learned how to compute derivatives of polynomials and radicals by switching them to fractional exponents. And then you learned other things like the product rule and the chain rule and, and all this uh, business. <clears throat> so let's review that briefly by way of example. So how about <clears throat> the derivative of the exponential of uh, 4x cubed plus 5. Very good. So there's, there's two rules that you have to sort of know and combine. There's two sort of base rules that give you the answer to this. On the one hand, here's one of the rules. You have that what is the derivative with respect to x of e to x. Just, just e to x. Well, I, I suppose you could write that thing, but that thing that you said is 1. So the derivative of e to x is e to x. <coughs> Furthermore, uh, that's the exponential rule. <coughs> then, what is the derivative with respect to x? of f of u, where u is conceivably some function of x. Well, that would be f prime evaluated at u and then multiplied by what? This must not be the way that your, your calculus one instructor wrote it. f prime evaluated at u multiplied by du dx. What is this extra du dx bit? Yeah, that's the chain rule. That's the chain rule. Okay, so combining these two together, <clears throat> that's telling you that the derivative with respect to x of e to u should be what? Should be e to u du dx. That's the combination of these two rules. That's the combination of the exponential rule with the chain rule. And so, hopefully I haven't confused the matter entirely. We'll just do this in the way that you're accustomed to. So the derivative of the exponential is the exponential itself. So e to 4x cubed plus 5. That's the exponential part of the rule. Then, for the chain rule, you must multiply by the derivative of 4x cubed plus 5. That is to say, e to u du dx. Okay? Then what is this part when you do it? 12x squared. So that's exponential 4x cubed 
plus 5 times 12x squared. Any question about this? <clears throat> so invariably, some student asks eventually, so I'll just ask it now. They say, can I write the 12 stuff on the, on the front? And I'll say, yeah, go ahead. But I'm not going to. And it, it, it disturbs students sometimes. They kind of like seem to really want that 12x squared to be in the front. <laughs> you can do that. That's fine. But if you ever find yourself in a different situation, like a more advanced, uh, a course where the more advanced calculus is required, like if you were to say, you know, I really want to be an economist and I want to know all this calculus -y stuff that goes with that, then the things, the things you're, you won't be computing derivatives of functions like this, you'll be computing derivatives of something a little bit different and the stuff has to go on the right. So by now, I'm psychologically conditioned to put this stuff on the right. <laughs> so I'm going to do it on the right. OK. So what if I was to ask you to compute the derivative of x squared plus 3x multiplied by the exponential of 5x? And that's kind of an interesting case because, <clears throat> because if it was just that, we'd be able to do it more or less immediately. And if it was just that, we'd be able to do it more or less immediately. But then we've got this product, which, which sort of raises the question, is there some kind of rule that tells you how to compute the derivative of a product? Oh, the product rule. OK, great. So that's a thing, right? Don't forget about it. So to remind you, that rule is the derivative with respect to x of u times v. Well, that's du dx, the first one, multiplied by v, plus u multiplied by dv dx. So that's the rule. And your instructor might have written it with primes or something and wrote u prime v plus u v prime. And that, that's fine too, as far as I'm concerned. OK. <clears throat> so doing that real quick, that's saying that this is the derivative of x squared plus 3x multiplied by e to 5x plus x squared plus 3x multiplied by the derivative of e to 5x. So that's just straightforward, minimal application of the product rule. And then <clears throat> what do you do from here? So are we, is it finished? Have we done it? Not quite, right? Because we've got to do that part and that part. <coughs> so that would be what? 2x plus 3. And then that part's already finished, so I just copy it. Yeah, and then plus x squared plus 3x. And then what's the derivative of e to 5x? Very good. Any question about this one? <clears throat> the quotient rule is also a thing, but I'll assume that you're going to review it. So now, <clears throat> let's talk about the product rule and the chain rule for a moment. So now, when, when, a, when a mathematician says the number 3, and when they say the number negative 4, and things like that, they have a specific idea in mind of what they're talking about. It's not really, it, it is in some ways kind of abstract, but, but it's a definite thing. 
So when you take the normal convention that the, that the reals are represented as a line, which is increasing to the right and decreasing to the left, then what the number three is, it's a little piece of line that has length three. If you were to get out, of, get out the ruler and measure it, it'd have length three, and it would be pointing to the right. That's what a three is. By analogy, what would a negative four be? Well, it, it too is a little piece of line. It has length what? Four, but it's pointing to the left. 10 is a little piece of line of length 10 pointing to the right. Negative pi is a little piece of line that has length about 3.14 that's pointing to the left. Okay, that's what they are. Now, when you consider a product, say like three times five, all the way hailing from fourth grade or whatever, we can all say, oh, three times five, that's 15. But what it, but geometrically, if three is a little line that's pointing to the right and has length three, and five is a little line pointing to the right has length three, then what is three times five? What is the product of three and five? And why is it what it is? <coughs> so we all know it's 15, but why? Okay, so you could, you could for example, take, take five of those three, three pieces and, and then put them side by side by side by side by side and then concat concatenate them. And then get out the ruler and, and do, do it that way. You could do it that way. But here's another way where you could say, okay, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the five and point it and make it horizontal. <clears throat> and I'm gonna make the three and make it vertical, actually. And then I'll hold the five still so that the, the five bit of line is not going to move. And I'm gonna take the three bit of line and drag it along the five. Or hold the three still and drag the five along the three. Either way, you sweep out a particular shape. What shape? A rectangle. And then what is the area of this shape? Yeah, it's 15, the product of those. So when a mathematician talks about product, almost always, if they're a geometry <coughs> person, geometry mathematician, they're talking about little rectangles. Okay, so a two-dimensional rectangle for a product of two things, a three-dimensional rectangle for a product of three things, a three-dimensional rectangle is a box. Right? So, <coughs> so when you're talking about the product rule, the, the derivative of the product of two functions, we're talking about somehow fundamentally the derivative of a rectangle, one of whose side length is f of x and the other is g of x. And somehow this rectangle is changing. This rectangle is changing and the derivative, the product rule has something to do with, well, if, if the one side length changes like that and the other side length changes like that, then the area must change like this. So. So how, how exactly will it do? So we have enough minute, minutes to draw it, but not get all the way through it. <clears throat> so what I want you to consider <clears throat> is that let's look at this g of x <clears throat> times f of x. That is to say the product of f and g is the area of a particular rectangle. Now, if we were to take that rectangle, and if we were to take the input x and change it a little bit, then f might get a little bigger, say like this much bigger. And g might get a little bigger too, but maybe a little bit less than f did, so something like that then the new shape is like this. <clears throat> it's 
So it got a little bit bigger in that way, a little bit bigger in that way. And as a result, there's these three new pieces, that piece, that piece, and the corner piece. So the first thing that we'll do on Thursday is we'll discuss that one of the terms in the product rule corresponds to this one. One of the terms in the product rule corresponds to this one. And in the limit, this little corner piece is too small to actually be measured. And it's not part of the product rule. And we'll see why on Thursday. So see you on Thursday. <clears throat>